Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. And I want to share something with you that our friend Ed shared with me. And I thought it would be really good to talk about today on the topic of heaven. We talked about hell last week. That was fun. And so <laughs> now we're going to talk about heaven. And I can't promise you that it's going to be more fun. I'm not sure. But this is a survey. So a survey was taken, a bunch of random people, I don't know how many, and they were asked what they expected to get when they got to heaven. Like, what are you going to see? What are you going to get when you get to heaven? So <laughs> normally, like, you do a countdown. You start at, like, five, right? You make your way down to one. I just want to start at one because it gets funnier if you do it that way, right? So the, f <laughs> the first thing that people expected to see in heaven was booze. That's what they were going to get. This is not a joke. That's what they hoped to get in heaven, booze, right? So maybe the survey was conducted in Naples. Um, <laughs> oh, you drive, right? So, okay. So, <laughs> so the <laughs> number two... I can't even do this. Number two, lost loved ones. That's what the booze was for, right? So, okay. <laughs> or the booze was better, right? Oh, you lied. I thought it was until death to us part. I could just keep going all day. So, anyway, uh, number three, lost pets, right? So, were they the pets you lost or the pet? Okay. So, anyway, you find those pets again in heaven. That's what people want to see. So, it's a good thing, right? The spouse was first, right? I, I kind of would have lost that bet. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the next thing, uh, number four, was like a feast or food, a party, some kind of party. It goes back to the alcohol probably. There's alcohol there too, right? So <laughs> it's all there, right? So if you know me, right, like you know that, well, if there isn't pizza in heaven, I'm not sure I want to go, really. I don't know. So anyway, <laughs> all right. But the sobering thing was, not one of them said Jesus. I do ruin your time. Okay, that's what I do. <laughs> All right. So we're in our series, Reset. Uh, really good. Like if you're a beginner, you came in at exactly the right time. We're just going through all the basics of everything. We're kind of looking at, you know, what is Christianity? And you kind of can look at it this way, like for those of you who have been here for a long time, by looking at the basics, looking at just what the Word of God says, not some opinion from somebody else, some scholar, some this, some that, just what does the Word of God say? Like it kind of has been bringing a question to mind in a lot of lifelong Christians uh, who have been coming if they haven't left. But <laughs> have we been doing this wrong? A lot of people kind of come up to me with that general sentiment, like, have we been doing this wrong? Or has the church as a whole been kind of like the mainstream church has really gotten this wrong? Because when we look at some of these things, it's like, that doesn't sound like what I've been taught at all. So it's really good. And so for those of you who've been around for a while or in Christianity or have been Christians for a long time, some of you are feeling like you need a, a reset. Like, I'd like to just reset and, you know, maybe kind of like start anew and, and, and get rid of some of that baggage or that old stuff. So that's what the series is all about. Um, so last week, again, we talked about hell, we talked about the consequences for sin, judgment, and we saw many, 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 many scriptures that Jesus will come and judge everyone, even Christians, so go back and watch that message if you're like, what did he say? The Bible said it, right? So, uh, and Jesus taught it in so many ways, right? So one of the parables we looked at is the sheep and the goats, right? Um, and we saw like that happening in Revelation, the prophecy of that happening in Revelation, but Jesus is, is giving a parable about it. And so just loosely, uh, you know, judgment time is, is here. That's what Jesus is saying or when, when it is. You know, I'm going to come, the Son of Man, Jesus is judging. And it's like this big flock. Everybody's together, but he separates them out. Right? So you have these sheep. And to the sheep, you know, great. Great, you know, you go into the kingdom prepared for you. This is wonderful because, and he goes through that list, you know, when I was hungry, thirsty, naked, you know, in prison, sick. You know, you took care of me. You saw me. You fed me. You know, when did we ever see you like that, Jesus? You know, and he's like, well, when you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Okay, so they go. then you got the goats, and it's bad for them. He goes through the list again, but they didn't do those things, so they go into the eternal fire. They're going to go into punishment. But picking up from there, 
All right, Matthew 25, 44. Then they'll reply, so these are the ghosts. Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, so Jesus will answer them. I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. So today, we're not going to look at necessarily that punishment, but we're going to look at the eternal life. So now we're going to say, okay, you guys are sheep, like what's going to happen? All right, so you got your first clue there, and, and we'll come back to that. You got your first clue, like Jesus was talking a lot about doing things, you know, so it should make you think. So let's think about heaven. What is heaven? So you could be dealing with, so like if I'm looking at the biblical Greek, you have to know the context because it's you know, kind of the same where they talk about like the heavens, you know, the sky where the clouds are, and they talk about heaven. So um, Pater Irmon, Ontis Oranis is the Greek. So Oranis, the heavens. When you see that word, that's the Our Father prayer, you all know. That's the very beginning of it. So if someone was Greek in here, they're bound to email me and say, your pronunciation is terrible. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, heaven sometimes is referred to as paradise. So uh, paradise, it's about three times in the New Testament referred to as paradise. You guys probably, if you've been in church for a while, the thief on the cross, right? Today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, so we're going to look at another one of those instances. It's also in Revelation. It comes up like that. Um, he used it as a synonym for heaven, and as we'll see in a moment or two, probably a temporary place, because if you know your Bible really well, you're going to get that, and we'll talk about it today, the new heavens and the new earth, and then what Jesus is talking about, the final judgment. So there's something in between, because we don't have the new heavens and the new earth right now, right? So heaven, though, sticking on that point, it's, it's our eternal home. Right? So it's real basic. It's hard for me sometimes, but like super, super basic. It's our eternal home that the Lord has prepared for us. We will be with him forever. Right? And now, as a part of that, and we'll look at this, Jesus himself said he's prepared. He, there are many rooms in this home, right? So think of it that way. Uh, the Apostle John, we talked about Revelation. He was privileged to see like glimpses, visions of what this was. Just indescribable almost, right? So a new heaven and new earth. The very presence of God is there. Um, no day, no night, right? So in the new heavens and new earth, you don't even need it, right? The sun is enough. The actual <laughs> Jesus is enough. There's not even a temple there. You don't need that, right? The Lord is the temple, it says. So it's like this perfect place where as we sang, Jesus is finally enough, right? But it's magnificent, right? Uh, <clears throat> Garden of Eden is restored. We see that tree of life sustaining the nations there, like the river left. So you see some of that imagery put back in here. Jesus is bringing us back to all the sheep, back to the garden. So it's kind of like that, total paradise. But uh, we can picture a garden, good illustrations for us, but our human minds can't understand how beautiful it's going to be. So that's really the point. Place of no more. So you have no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain, right? So you reach a certain age, you're like, wow. <laughs> you know, no more of that, right? It's, it's, it's nothing, right? You're not losing anyone. Death has lost its power. That's it. Um, it's literally just to be with God. Now, <clears throat> it's real, right? So uh, heaven is in a lot of ways fictionalized by our culture and things like that. And I think a lot of Christians, like they don't, by the way they behave here, right, and they value certain things here, I'm kind of like, do you believe that heaven's a real place that you're actually going to, right? So we have to start thinking that way. It really is better than everything here without all the problems, right? So uh, to deny that, like, there, to say there isn't a heaven, right, is to deny what Jesus taught, right, a lot. So you're denying Christ himself when you deny what he's teaching, um, it's a real deal. So we talked about uh, last week that Sheol or Hades, and I told you in the Greek, there's like a couple different words at play in there, uh, depending on whether you're looking at heaven or Hades. In some translations, they don't parse it out. Um, but we saw that it's a place because there's no new heavens and new earth, right, that people go. That's what it means when you read Sheol, perhaps, in a more literal word-for-word you know, -word version of the Old Testament. Uh, Hades, you might see that and be like, wait a minute, that's not necessarily hell. Well, it's that temporary place, right? So uh, Abraham's bosom, it is sometimes called for those who are good. And then goats, <laughs> they go to the other side. Uh, so you remember the rich man and Lazarus. We talked about that parable. And again, what happens? Like, why is the rich man a goat? 
it didn't help Lazarus, right? So Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. He's in a good place, right? But the rich man is in a bad place, right? And you see them kind of dialoguing with Abraham in there. Uh, so perhaps, you know, uh, that's a part of what this paradise is, that good side where Lazarus was. Okay. Uh, again, the thief on the cross. Paul kind of uh, alludes to that and then uh, says it. We'll look at that in a minute. Uh, but he talks about in uh, Philippians chapter 1, he'll talk about like, you know, it's better for me to just go and go home and be with the Lord, right? But I'll stick around for your sake, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I'll go and be with the Lord. So he's kind of alluding to this, not, he's not saying like, I'm going to go and be in heaven right now. Uh, he doesn't say that. So um, this concept comes up also uh, in 2 Corinthians of like the second heaven or third heaven, like what is, what is that? Is there such a thing? All right, so the idea of more than one type of heaven, it's reinforced by the Bible, like in Hebrews uh, chapter 7, it'll say like heavens, you know, it'll start to use like a plural, but it doesn't mean like clouds, it means different things. And Paul kind of lets us see into that a little bit. So in 2 Corinthians, uh, the two main reasons for writing, there's always a reason for writing the letters, um, they're dragging their feet on a collection uh, for Jerusalem, and so he's prodding them along. Then there are these super apostles, and that's not a compliment, right? So uh, there are these false teachers he's kind of fighting against. So instead of like doing what they do, he flips it, and he's going to boast Kafima about uh, his sufferings, right? So it's called the fool's boast, people call it. Uh, so as he's doing that, and as a part of this, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 1, this boasting will do no good, but I must go on. I will reluctantly tell about visions and revelations from the Lord. Uh, in, the liter uh, I keep saying the in the more word-for-word -word translation, he's putting it off like, I know a man, right? But you know he's talking about himself, right? So that's why uh, easy-to-read translation will say, I was caught up uh, to the third heaven. Like, what's that, 14 years ago? Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that, the, uh, that they cannot be expressed in words, right? So <clears throat> things no human is allowed to tell. So just notice something I'm thinking and talking at the same time. Uh, heaven and paradise uses both words. In the Greek, that's what it says. It's pretty accurate, right? Uh, so both. But uh, perhaps there's a reasoning why Paul's not telling us what it is, right? Perhaps it's too great, wonderful for us to really comprehend. But if a third heaven exists, right, there have to be two others. So you think of it that way, right? So probably, you know, if you're reading the Bible, you've got the sky. The first heaven's like, you know, what we can see, the clouds, the sky. Uh, the other one is, you know, the celestial bodies, right? So space, think of it like that. And then maybe the third heaven is perhaps this paradise that Paul gets a glimpse into, Perhaps it's the new heavens and earth. We're not really totally sure. Most people think it's like that paradise that Jesus is talking about, right? So a couple of just really quick false teachings. I, you know, it's funny looking back at my notes and what we had to learn, like, you know, in pastor school. Uh, they prepare you for some bad theology, but basically, like, careful, well... Sometimes you're going to hear people maybe in more charismatic movements. There's nothing wrong with that, but uh, there is wrong, something wrong with the theology. They'll come up with this weird stuff that, you know, they'll grab a little bit from like Ephesians or something and start talking about the air. Like there are a lot of idiomatic phrases in the Bible, and so they'll kind of stretch it beyond what the Word of God says, and they'll start talking about getting prophecies from like a third heaven and a second heaven, and the second heaven's where the demons are, so you've got to be careful and you've got to discern that. It just turns into this wacky theology that just doesn't really make biblical sense. Uh, we have one word of God, the word of God. And what they're doing is they're getting a new word. So if you ever go into church and hear someone say new word, leave. <laughs> There's no new word, right? Unless I'm talking about pizza, then yeah. But otherwise, no, right? There's the word of God. There's no new revelation, no new word. No, wrong, 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 wrong. Uh, because then we can just get a new word and put it on top of this and then make it about whatever we want. Not good. All right, so... Uh, Let's talk about how we get in. How do we get in heaven? All right. Everyone got quiet. They're like, oh, no. All right. Through, through Jesus alone. And that's the first thing. That's it. Like, if, one main thing. Dude, Christ alone. Period. Right? Not the God of our understanding. Not no, this flying spaghetti monster. Jesus alone. Not the God the way I think. Not Allah. Not this. Not that. Jesus, who is God. Jesus alone. That's it. 
All right, so remember we are in John 14. Jesus is the only way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Great, 14.6. But let's back up to one on our thinking today, on the topic today. John 14.1. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my Father's home. Ah, there we go. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going, right? So... No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So how do we get, what's the way? How do we get there? Jesus gives the clear answer because that's like what he's alluding to. Thomas is not getting it, but that's okay. He still answers the question, right? You get there through me. How do we know the way to that home? Through me. I'm the only way. Nobody gets in except through me. So we need to know that. All right, so here we see that depiction of a home, right? A heavenly home. And Jesus is the only way to that home. Uh, everybody understood this. Jesus, right, after his crucifixion, right, he rises from the dead, his ascension to heaven. Peter understands this. He's preaching in Acts. Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else. He's talking about Jesus. God has given no other name under heaven with, uh, by which we must be saved, right? So that's it. That is the Christian understanding, the biblical understanding, period. So number one, how do we get there? We must believe in Jesus. Amen. All right, so affirmed here, Romans 10, 9. If you openly declare that Jesus is your Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Now, if we have people with good reading comprehension skills in the audience, you notice there's a couple of different things going on here. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made righteous, you're made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Huh? So a more literal version. Oh, that's just the NLT, Pastor. <laughs> okay, no, it's not. Uh, Romans 10.10. 10. This is an LEB. It's pretty close. Like, if I'm really lazy and I don't feel like reading the Greek, I go to the LEB. So if you want to know, like, it's not my favorite translation, but really good word for word. Roman 10, uh, Romans 10.10. 10. For with the heart, one believes, right? Resulting in righteousness. So there's a bigger word there. And with the mouth, one confesses. Resulting in salvation. Wow, doesn't sound like a lot, what a lot of us have been taught, does it? It's funny when we just read the Bible for ourselves. So we see that faith is the first component here, and I'm going to affirm that, how important that is. There's something else going on. Interesting. So Ephesians 2.8, this is the classic verse for that. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Amen. That is correct. Right? This is the word of God. So <clears throat> we're saved. God's grace, our faith in, and our just what he's talking about here is Jesus, right? That's the important thing. Now, when we look at the full counsel of God's word, we also see something like that confess or declare statement just by reading one more verse. <laughs> so here's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I just read it to you. But then 10, another verse 10, says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. There's like a, so that statement. You are saved, so you can do good things, right? So to be clear, we are not saved by works, right? No, and that's not what I'm saying, right? But if you watched last week's message or you saw last week's message, you know what I'm saying, right? And what we do says more about that faith we claim to have, right, than anything we just say, right? So what did Jesus say in his parables? And you might be noticing something right now. He puts a lot of emphasis on doing stuff, right? <clears throat> well, it says, and he said this, our words will either acquit or condemn us. That's it. That's really interesting, right? The words will either acquit or condemn you. And we looked at that. And remember in Titus 1, 16. He's talking about like false teachers, you know, just uh, bad people. They deny Jesus by the way they live. And I brought that statement up last week. They deny him by the way. So let's put that together a little bit. Wait, well, we're saved if we, right, confess, right, declare. What's the opposite? Deny. 
And Jesus teaches you can do that in word and deed. Right? That's what the sheep and the goats is all about. So interesting. So remember Galatians 5. We looked at uh, some of the consequences by living in the flesh. We saw a very, very uh, profound statement. And it wasn't a one-off, right? So Paul's talking about, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God is talking about right, the, the, fruit, uh, the, well, the rotten fruit, the, the, the deeds of the flesh, right, the bad sins of the flesh uh, versus the fruit of the Spirit. Right? And then he makes a comment in there, like those living a life like this, you know, the, the sin, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And if you read the Bible a lot, you're like, yeah, it says that a lot. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, same thing. It says it twice. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. But Paul's not talking about anything else but what we do. That's the only thing he's talking about there. Those who do these things, those who live this way, will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's like, you do, people, <laughs> this isn't being read to enough people. It's interesting. But if we keep reading Ephesians, so if someone wanted to run with verses, you know, uh, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, read 10, but keep reading because it says the same exact thing. Ephesians 5, 1. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us. Honestly, if I had more time, I would just like make everyone sit there and just meditate on that for like 15, 20 minutes. Think about it. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us. Should we be motivated then to do anything wrong? So why is... That's why Paul's disclaimering here. He's getting your mind right. A pleasing Roman of God. So, Roman of God, so he's like, a, like an Old Testament sacrifice that he would burn. <clears throat> he loved us and offered us. Okay, there, let there be no, so right after that, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Profound. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed. Such sins, Sexual immorality, impurity, and greed, sin, have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, sins, foolish talk, sins, other coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of the world. There it is again. So, yeah, we're saved by grace, but what did it just plainly and redundantly say we should see that you're saved by grace right you should be reciprocating that grace here it's very redundant very very redundant there's some exclusions it's it should it scared me when i really realized it right and again if we go back to last week's week's message christ is that sacrifice and we shouldn't reject him by sinning that's what that is right that's great but i'm not going to obey you um not great. We talked about this a little last week. Think, think about this. We're talking about it in the context of like getting into heaven, okay? God tells us what to do. We're going to look at his command of obedience, right? And then we on earth decide, nah, no, 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 no. It's called rejecting him. That's what that is. But how crazy are some people? I'm going to reject God. I'm going to reject this. I'm not going to read it. We talked about the love letter. Like if this is a love letter, right? You get a love letter from your spouse and you're like, it has dust on it. You have never opened it. How are you going to feel about that? I wouldn't feel good. Right? I talked about how precious, like my wife writes me a letter, precious. Right? But no. no. <laughs> What's that called when you do that? Right? But then, now I want to be with you forever because it benefits me. Careful. Careful. So logic would dictate if you rejected him in this entire lifetime, what makes anyone believe you'd want to all of a sudden be with him forever? Doesn't make sense. All right, so we talked about that in light of God being so mean, sending people there. It's like, <laughs> he's not going to put you through anything you don't want to go through, right? Like be with him a lot. So the Bible says <clears throat> we should prove it by the way we live. And this is a, real, like a foreign concept to a lot of people. Like, huh? John the Baptist, ushering the way for Jesus, the Messiah's herald, right? Matthew 3, 7, but when he saw, John, many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them. You brood of snakes, he exclaimed, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? 
prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe for we're descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. So we see that illustration coming from John now. Remember the bad tree we talked about uh, last week. Uh, Jesus included in his teachings. Other places, just picking a couple here. Acts. Um, so Paul is uh, giving his defense uh, before like uh, Agrippa. Uh, Acts 26.20, I preach first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and all throughout, or throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that all must repent. So must repent of their sins. Repent of their sins. Like, not do them and turn to God. And prove they have changed by the good things they do must. That's the message Paul preached. James 3.3, 3. if you're wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Uh, again, we talked about the woman caught in adultery, right? He saved her, right? <laughs> saved her. She, she, by the law of Moses, they could have stoned her to death, but he saved her, right? Okay, I saved you. And then he expected a response, go and sin no more. He expected there to be a response. So that's what this is saying. It's not saying we're saved by any of these works. It's saying, well, you know, if you know that you're saved and you really love Jesus and he's really your Lord, well, we should be seeing a response, an appropriate response to a sacrifice with the magnitude and glory that that had, right? So, I mean, it's just unbelievable what we see, right? So there's a sacrifice. This is unbelievable. It's God dying for us, right? And then he rises from the dead and ascends to heaven. Hello, What's the response to that, right? So it's saying, if you, so what was the first component? Faith. Okay, well, if you really believe this, then there's going to be an amazing response to something so incredibly amazing. Makes sense, right? So we talked about the tree and its fruit. And so on that gravity, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus, there's the, he records another statement Jesus makes, different time and context, but uh, Luke 6, 43. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. So this will sound familiar to Matthew, but a bad tree can't produce good fruit. The tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. <clears throat> what you say flows from what's in your heart. So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Jesus addresses those, right, who might be saying they're Christians, but he's calling them out. Why do you keep saying that if you're not doing what I'm saying, right? So it, it, it hit me really hard when a pastor said this one time in a sermon. It's like, if he's not your Lord, he's not your Savior, and that's true. So the first key to heaven was that faith. And then we're seeing here, second key, repent, is obedience. It's obedience. It's a part of it, right? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, if you don't obey me? Now, if we go back to John 14, we see something that will reaffirm this point from God's word. Uh, <clears throat> we looked at this a little bit in the Trinity message. John 14, 15, but we're just continuing to the 15th verse. If you love me, obey my commandments. There it is again. And I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. So we talked about the Holy Spirit. We talked about the Trinity. who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and it doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and will be later in you or in you later. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. So the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you will also live. When I'm raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each one of them. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name, said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each one of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey. And remember, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. So I think Jesus makes it pretty clear. Right? Pretty clear. All who love him 
will obey. That's how we know someone believes in and loves Jesus. They obey him. Jesus' words, not mine. I didn't come up with this. Right? This is Jesus' theology. Then, did you notice what happens as a result? Then, my father, right, then they will get into that home. So they sound like prerequisites to me. Just saying. So obedience is a real key here, and Jesus emphasizes it a lot. A lot. It's unreal. Right? He plainly teaches obedience is required. You know? So again, the sheep and the goats, the tree and the fruit, like, I mean, just everything, the parable of the talents, like, you just keep going and going and going and going. It's all about obedience, all about doing something, putting those words or that faith in actions. If we continued in James, we'd see this, right? Faith without the action, without good works is dead. It's useless. So it's pretty consistent. Now, in 1 Peter, we talked about uh, judgment, right? But we'll see it again if we're looking at it in this context. 1 Peter 4.17, for the time has come for judgment. And it must begin with... God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what happens to godless sinners? So we see here, not only do we need to hear the gospel, we need to obey the gospel. We need to obey it. Right? We saw this in Hebrews 10 as well. Obedience was a key. Yes, we are saved by grace through faith. But again, what we do says more about that faith we claim to have than anything we say. Right? And we looked at that, uh, we looked at it briefly, the, the final heaven. So if we're thinking about the, the new heavens and the new earth, and just kind of go through it really quickly. Remember, there's kind of like an entrance thing going on here, right? So you saw the sheep and the goats play out, right? And, and the people who don't get in, right, Revelation 21, the cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt murderers, immoral, those who practice witchcraft. Just remember that one. That sounds really weird. Sorcery, but just remember that. Idol worshipers, all liars, all liars. Their fates in the fiery lake, right? And if you continue reading, same type of thing gets reiterated. Nothing evil will be able to allowed to enter the new heaven and the new earth. No. Nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, like the liars again, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So remember two things. Cowards don't get in and uh, those practicing sorcery, because we'll come back to it. Just remember that. So again, we're saved by grace, but they're just like are tons and tons and tons of warning against our behavior, against bad behavior, over and over again, right? I would be a horrible teacher if I wasn't reading these things to you, right? It's just the Word of God, all right? So here's the thing, again, liars, right? So why are they like, well, they may be lying about being a Christian, right? So that's, that's the thing to think about there. All right, so here's the thing. So how can we be certain, though? So this is how to get there is what the Bible says. How can we be certain we're getting it? So that's a lot of people ask. Like, they're like, oh, my faith. Like, I don't know if I'm getting in or not. All right. Well, it goes back to that baptism. Right? So we're baptized in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I talked about the Holy Spirit being a very serious operative part of our salvation, right? Uh, really, really important. So I just want to go through, like, when we look at the Word of God, there are kind of like some baptismal prerequisites that we see. And it's quite interesting. Um, so... We're going to look at baptism in a few weeks. I'm not going to go into it like too, too heavy now, but just a few things to think about. So you might say, what? Baptismal prerequisites. Well, yeah, faith. <laughs> yeah, that confession, right? That outward confession, all right? Uh, confess and declare. Then there's that thing called repentance. No one wants to talk about that, which is not just like acknowledging your sins. It's acknowledging them and then turning from them, not doing them anymore. Right? So that's clearly required, right? Repent. Uh, we see... And Jesus, right, uh, he is baptized. He's tempted in the wilderness, doesn't fall for it. He comes to Galilee, preaches. Mark 1.15, the time promised by God has come at last. Jesus announced, the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe in the good news. Ding, ding. Believe and stop it like the woman caught in adultery. Right? So there it is again. Right? It's an important step. Jesus denies himself. He expects us to do the same. All right. uh, so on that, uh, Mark 8, Jesus predicts his suffering. So he, so he tells his disciples like what's going to be happening to him. 
And in Mark's gospel, it's like the first time out of three he does this. So the first time, Peter takes him aside, right, and kind of reprimands him like, oh, this isn't going to happen to you, All right? So it's, he, he turns, looked at his disciples and reprimands Peter. He said this famous line, like, get behind me, Satan, right? You're thinking like human way, like you're not thinking uh, kingdom-minded. You're not thinking the way God thinks. And then Mark 8.34, then calling the crowd to join his disciples. He's going to clarify. He's like, come on, everybody, you need to hear this. If any of you wants to be my follower, Okay, so he's saying this to us. If anyone wants, because the big crowd, anyone wants to be a follower, you must give up your own ways. You might deny yourself is literally what it says. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? It's this uh, Greek life, but Clearly, eternal life is implied here, so it's a good translation. Is anything worth more than your soul? So we see that Jesus clearly gives some prerequisites here. Right? So, well, if you want to be my follower, belief is implied, and he said that before. So there you go. He already said that, Mark 1. Belief is implied. Denying yourself. So there's the repentance again. Deny yourself. Repent. Turn. Like, stop it. Right? And then take up your cross. Now, people are like, do we have to get killed to go to heaven? No. Uh, but it might happen, and if it does, it's awesome, especially if you get beheaded in Revelation, because then you get to, like, you want to judge people? You get to do that for a thousand years if you're beheaded. So, you know what? It'd be awesome if someone would put up a beheading sign-up sheet. Martyrdom mission trip, right? So, like, who wants to go with Pastor Gene and get beheaded, right? So, but anyway, it's a good thing in the Bible. It really doesn't sound anything like what you normally hear on a Sunday, does it? Getting beheaded is a good thing. All right, if you believe and if you repented, otherwise, very bad, right? So, anyway, <laughs> so if we keep reading, though, like, you know, he sounds crazy, yes, but so does Jesus sometimes because the very next line, after what I just read you, right? Where's the prophet man to give up the whole world right? and lose his soul? Then he says it's exactly this. Mark 8.38. If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. What? So it goes right back to that declare and confess thing. You relinquish that right, right? If you deny him is what he's saying. Right, now go back to Revelations, because this came up, a re Revelation with an N, not an S. <laughs> go back there. Oh, this came up a little bit, I think, in Bible study or something like that, right? Cowards? Right? Why are cowards in there or liars? Well, think about it, right? Who wasn't afraid? The martyrs were not afraid to die. The people who denied Jesus, not getting in. They're your cowards. Right, so if we go back a little bit in Revelation, uh, there's just a little context. The war in heaven, so Mark, Michael the archangel and throws the dragon basically out of heaven. But we see this, Revelation 12.10. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, It has come at last, salvation and power in the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of his brothers and sisters has been thrown down to the earth, the one who accuses them before God day and night. And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. There it is, right? So, the cowards. So remember, it connects to that, right? Confessing the Lord, believing and declaring and not doing, right, the reverse, of course, of that declaration, which would be denial. And I would add, in word and deed. That's what the Word of God says. So, to help us with this, again, we're baptized in the Trinity. We have the Holy Spirit. It sounds very difficult, right? But I talked about that illustration really quick. Like, if you think about, like, you know, the rooms of, uh, recovery rooms of AA or whatever uh, group it is, you know, you're talking about people who, you know, it's the prerequisite isn't having the Lord Jesus, right, or, or the Holy Spirit in them. They pick a particular sin, and a big one, right, their life sin, and they give it up. They just stop. You know, and we're Christians running around, you need the Holy Spirit, you need the Holy Spirit, you know, <laughs> and they're still sinning. It's like, that's not convincing. It doesn't really look very convincing to me. No, thanks. I'm not going to become a Christian. I'll just, you know, right? So, like, the, if people in the rooms can do it, like, we have the Holy Spirit. We should, it should be easy, all right? So, he is not only that, like, that key to helping with that obedience. And again, I'll say, I said it last week, we all make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. It's not what I'm talking about. We looked at that like intentional sin over and over again, right? But he's also our assurance of heaven, 
Right? So think about it, right? He's the seal of our salvation. He's our comforter. He's our advocate. He's our helper. Right? So if you're talking to God, if you're praying and he's in you, you know. You know. That's the key. So if anyone wants to talk about baptism, come see me, right? So <laughs> that's the key. He assures you. You know, my faith isn't always like, bam, 100%, right? But I get low sometimes and then I have my talk with God and it's fine. Right? I know. I'm very certain because he tells me. So that's a big portion of being baptized. And so that's the confidence we have. So a few quick questions about heaven, and we'll draw it closer to a close. <laughs> but uh, funny things like, you know, people talk about heaven. Like we talked about universalism. Is everyone getting in? No. <laughs> it's just it. Not another popular thing. I'll see you in heaven. Nope. Right? So only through Jesus, right? And then when it's too late, it's too late. That's it. Done. All right? Uh, funny one. Can people see us in heaven? Like, you know, like, are there people watching us from heaven? So uh, I'll lighten it up a little bit. Well, first I'll get really depressing, then it'll get funny. But anyway, <laughs> like, um, so my dad was reaching his final week of life here on earth, right? So um, I believe what Jesus says very strongly. So um, you believe what you want, but he says, right, if you don't forgive others, you will not be forgiven. So, <laughs> dad's dying. So I'm racing there, and I'm like, yeah, please forgive me of everything. I forgive you. Like, you know, I take that very serious because I don't get another chance at that one. So I'm, you know, reconciling. We're making our amends. Everything is good, you know. We're kind of putting it aside. And um, so you could tell he's a little nervous, you know, no, normal. So <laughs> a little nervous, and he's like, okay, Gene, you know, you know the Bible really well. You're a pastor, all that. Um, you know, what do you think? You know, am I going to heaven? And so I went through the gospel. Right? You know, but basically, like, you know, do you believe he's, he's, he's a Catholic, but I believe he's saved. But let's go through this. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Right? Is he Lord? He's God. All this. Do you believe in him? Right? Yes. Great. You just declared it. Yeah. Good. I'll see you in heaven. Then the next thing I said was, okay, so if Romans 12 is right, and we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses looking down on us. If that's true, Dad, I got to ask you, stay out of the bedroom and the bathroom, please. You need a sense of humor to die around me. That's the requirement. You're talking about going to heaven. If you want to die around me, you better have a really good sense of humor. I, was really, I really said that. But there was maybe, I'll confess, an expletive in there. But anyway, not really, because Jesus says hell. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway. So uh, that idea, such so a question, like, <laughs> that idea comes from, yeah, I'm crazy, but <laughs> it's actually worse in person, but we're not going to go there. I'm being taped. Uh, so uh, it comes from Hebrews 12. Uh, you know, could there be, I don't know, you know what I mean, but uh, what's being talked about, we'll get back to it in a minute, but we'll come, what he's talking about is like all these uh, people of the faith. He's talking about like the heroes uh, of the faith, and then he gets to like, ah, you know, therefore we're surrounded by this great cloud or crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, it says. So it could just be examples, right? So we don't really have anything. Uh, you know, <clears throat> some might say, though, you know, you can communicate with the dead because Saul and Samuel, if you read your Bible, you're like, oh. Remember that before he dies, he gets killed by the Philistines. Um, just some context on that, if that, that comes to mind, because yes, uh, a witch, <laughs> a medium actually, but let's call her a witch, because she's sinning, uh, brings up Samuel for the day. Saul wants to know what's going on. He's not hearing from the Lord. The Lord has abandoned him. And uh, Samuel just comes up from the grave to tell him he's going to die. But if you look at the background, the medium he goes to, like a, like a sorceress who could bring Samuel from the dead, um, she, she, he's already banned all mediums, like because the law says, I think it's like Leviticus 20 and more, uh, redundant that like you're not supposed to do that you die you haven't you, do not consult me get rid of your Ouija board if you have that that's got to go right so it's basically what's going on here we need to trust in the Lord um, so he's already banned it and then he goes and does it and so the woman's first response Samuel comes up she's like what are you trying to do get me killed like so she knows she's done something wrong and he's done something wrong it's wrong right it's wrong you're not supposed to do that uh, so anyway, that's the context there. And it's really kind of a one-off. I'm not recalling any other place uh, where something even like that happened. Uh, so it's a, it's a one-off. So don't, you know, put your doctrine in one-offs. We've talked about this before. It should be redundant, like something Jesus says very redundantly. Uh, so A, it's a one-off. Uh, B, but you know, it should make us think. We put that together. Uh, Jesus would correct that by giving that parable, again, of the rich man and Lazarus. Right? What happens? You know, the rich man's like, ah, send Lazarus, send somebody to warn my five brothers. Right? Jesus said, nope, too late. They had the law of Moses. They didn't obey that. 
done, right? And then wait a minute, what was the rich man saying? Like, oh, I can somehow communicate. No, you can't. No, you can't. No one can come over from one side to another or communicate this way and that way. So just a little side note for some denominations that are like praying to people in heaven. It's not a very biblical concept. And the other thing I would add is this is probably God's point in those mediums. You need to trust in him. And so we have access. We can pray directly to God. Why shortchange yourself by praying to a mere person? Doesn't make any sense, does it? No, right? So just on that note. Uh, so I wouldn't put too much stock in people who say there are people watching us. It wouldn't matter. Uh, I don't need to pray to my dad. You know? <laughs> He's not better than God, right? So um, and people will ask, for a funny one, what will we look like in heaven? Brad Pitt. That's who I want to look like in heaven, right? So anyway, yeah, yeah whatever. So <laughs> anyway, so, I don't know. My wife didn't ask. I'm just saying it's what I want to look like. Uh, it'll get to the next question too, which will be even funnier. But anyway, um, Paul addresses this in <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15. He's talking about the resurrection. That's the, real, the overlying context of that chapter. And he says, basically, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will we have? There, so in 1 Corinthians, like going back and forth, they've asked questions. There's another letter, and he's answering these questions. And he basically says, what a foolish question. <laughs> That's hilarious, right? So, and he uh, gives the analogy of seed. Like basically when you put a seed in the ground, like it symbolizes your body dying, it's going to come up a different kind of plant. Or like, you know, not from the seed, but it's going to look different than the seed, right? So our body is the seed. It comes up a beautiful plant, right? So not like the body you have now, right? Um, it adds, we're going to get incorrupted. This is mortal. and incor It's corruptible. It's, it's going to die. So, of course, we're not going to get a body like that. I'm glad you affirmed that. It is, we're going to die. So, <laughs> so, you know, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be an un uncorruptible body, free from sin, free from all these different things, right? So, it's better, right? Um, so, yeah, uh, a lot of us will be really glad to get that new body in heaven, right? So, that's going to be a good thing. Spouses are now nudging. But anyway, <laughs> wait, um, but here, just a quick thing. All right, same letter, 1 Corinthians 3 and 6. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Anyone who destroys that body, God will destroy. Careful, right? So our bodies, while we're here, are temples of God. We should respect them. So on that note, it's not an excuse to just trash your body. All right, get less serious here. Will we be married in heaven? This is one of the things I talk about just being quiet. Right. Will we be married in heaven? Well, if we have a new body, I hope so, right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> men are being very good right now. Don't laugh, don't laugh, don't laugh. <laughs> Maybe the women are. Uh, so Jesus clears this one up too. In Mark 12, we see something here. Uh, famous question. Uh, you might know, where's my starting point? You might know about the, the give to Caesar, what is Caesar? He's being kind of trying to be, they're trying to trap him, the Pharisees. You know, give to Caesar what, what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. Uh, people forget about the Sadducees. So it's another religious group. And the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. I don't believe in that. So they're trying to trap him. They, they probably are recalling Tobit here. It's a woman who has seven husbands that die. And uh, so older versions will note that. And, oh, it says this in Tobit. But anyway, um, nerding out. <laughs> so <clears throat> the, this woman has seven husbands. They all die. Doesn't have any children. The question is, you know, who are they going to be married to, to in heaven? And the point is, you know, Jesus is like, you don't get it. But they're not going to be given to marriage or get married. They're going to be like the angels. So that's what Jesus tells us. It's going to be so good that even if, like, you love your spouse, it'll be better. Notice I didn't look at my wife when I said any of that. All right, so, <laughs> okay. Are your pets in heaven? That's another important question. Do all dogs really go to heaven? All right. Well, you may not want to be with your spouse forever. Maybe you really meant it when you said until death do us part, right? But you may want to be with your dog. And I get that, right? So, <laughs> so, you know, the Bible, you know, in Galatians, like, or, I'm sorry, uh, in, in Genesis, you know, animals are good. Uh, it indicates that there'll be like this new heaven and new earth in Revelation, Isaiah, you know, 11, 65. Talk about like humans coexisting, you know, with animals and stuff. Um, so it doesn't really explicitly just the short of it is, it doesn't say yes or no. We, we don't really have anything. All right, so some will say like, you know, we're made in God's image and that's why we have a soul. Right? But animals aren't, so they don't have a soul. You know, so what goes to heaven? Right? So our soul, what did Jesus say? Your soul goes to heaven. Like, so if pets don't have one, they don't go. 
But I don't know. Uh, there's no reason God couldn't bring your pets up from the dead and send them there with you. I, it doesn't say that. Uh, Psalm 49 is probably the most, I think, definitive and equally confusing thing. Uh, in there, it's talking about the wicked, and it will say that they'll perish, just like animals, if you're reading. And so some would take that to say perish, meaning like, like animals, like that's it, the wicked, that they're gone. But that's the fate of fools. But if you keep reading, like sheep, they're led to Sheol. So that's a temporary place. And so maybe the sheep go to Sheol, right? So uh, it could go either way there. So the truth is, you have a couple things you can look at. There's no definitive teaching. Again, what's the point? We must remember that heaven will surpass anything we can imagine is good here. We just, quite frankly, won't care. We're not going to have those worries, right? It's better than anything you can imagine. Even Naples. Imagine that. All right, I'm going to get an email from... I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we are saved by our faith in Jesus, right? <clears throat> Who promised heaven to us to those who obey him. It's just very clear, right? Our faith should cause us to obey is the point, right? So now if we look at Hebrews 11, we'll go there. Uh, so it'll take us through these people of faith, right? If we're looking at Hebrews 11, and it'll take us right to that cloud of witnesses or crowd of witnesses. But uh, if you go back, they, it says they were looking for something better. That was the point. That's how they were faithful. So again, it places that emphasis on what they did. Well, why? They were people of faith. Well, what did they do? Right? So Noah, Abraham, in Hebrews 11, 13 says, all these people died st uh, still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on the earth. It sounds like Peter, right? Like aliens here. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for a country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. It's a heavenly home. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. So it sounds a lot like John 14, doesn't it? He's prepared a home for us. So that's what it's talking about. Even Moses, it says, like he chose the oppression with God's people rather than the riches, if you know the Exodus story of Pharaoh. He could have been in Pharaoh's palace, but instead he chose something different. He gave up those riches of the world uh, for a heavenly home, right? He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. Right? It sounds like Colossians 1, 15, right? He's the vis Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Brings us into 12. No chapter breaks in the original. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd or cloud of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Does that make a little bit more sense now after what we talked about? Offload the sin, right? That's how you do it. All right, so really interesting. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. How? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. That's how. We keep our eyes, our minds, our heart on Jesus. That's how. Right? We get to that heavenly home God prepared for us by fixing our eyes on Jesus and everything we think, feel, and do. Right? We looked at Revelation. We see this description of it. So let's go there now as we kind of close here. Revelation 21.1. Then I saw a new heaven, this is John, and a new earth, uh, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, gone. Now this is here. And the sea was also gone, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a, sh a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow, no more crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for I tell you it is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. God's home will now be among his people. That's the heavenly home we believe in. So that's the encouragement. No matter what you are going through here, you have that eternal home, that real home. This is not our home. That is perfect. Right? There will be no more death, no more sickness, no more sorrow as a result of these things, no more pain. 
And I think a lot of us must remember, in Naples does sound like paradise. There won't be any stuff either. But guess what? Moss can't eat it. Rust can't destroy it. Right? Doesn't fade away. Thieves can't steal our stuff. We don't have to worry about that either. Because if we're being honest, a lot of our stuff causes more problems than joy. All right? So just to close from some encouragement from the Word of God. Go back to 2 Corinthians. We know the context. 2 Corinthians 4.14. We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving. And God will receive more and more glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small. And they won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them. And will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. He continues. No chapter breaks. 2 Corinthians 5.1 For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. Amen. Amen. So I think I'm going to leave it with that because there's nothing better that I can say. But I will pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everyone who came in today to hear your word, those who are faithful to it. And Lord, I pray, I pray that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. And just guide us to a life of obedience in you. A life just loving you and loving others as a result. Fashion us into holy vessels of your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your self-control. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.